All right. If you got your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56 is going to be the main place we are today. You know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's just the small things that can make a big difference in our worship. A couple, couple weeks ago when we had a, an elder meeting, one of the things that Micah brought up was, you know, a lot of times in that prayer before we kind of, the pastor gets up here and starts preaching, some of us are moving around, we used to be doing things, and he encouraged us to, to kind of just be still and be in that prayer and like most things Micah says, at first I think they're weird, but then when they get implemented, they usually end up being right because I'm just, oh, it just means so much just to be in tune and actually be focused on a prayer and not be thinking about what's coming next, just to be in the moment and just be in that prayer. But Isaiah 56 is going to be the main place that we're going to be today. And I know a lot of the recent messages here have been on idolatry and the great danger and sin of idolatry and when I look at idolatry I look at something that it's obviously not a new sin it's something that's been around for forever lifting something up in the place where God is supposed to be and the great danger of idolatry that I've seen in my study is that idolatry is taking your eye off of where it's supposed to be your eyes are supposed to be on God our eyes are supposed to be on God and idolatry is taking that focus and putting it on something else. It, it makes me think of, I'm a, I'm a baseball fan. The hardest position to play in baseball is, is the outfield because you're out there on an island, you're out there by yourself, and a pop fly gets hit in the air, and the, the outfielder's looking for the ball, he's looking for it, but he's got things that are trying to cloud his vision and get in his way. If it's a day game, he's, he's looking, you know, and the sunshine is up there, and the sunshine can blind him. That's why they have those sunglasses. If it's a night game, he's got lights on. And those things can interfere. If he's in a certain stadium, maybe the scoreboard's in the way, or if he's at a certain angle, the crowd is in the way. And you'll see grown professional athletes that get paid millions of dollars that the ball drops right in front of them. You're like, how did, he, how did he miss that? It's because something got in his way and something distracted him from what he was supposed to be focused on. And what it ended up leading to was not just a mistake on his part, but something that could cost his team. And with idolatry, it is literally something that is taking our mind and our eye off of God and placing it on something else. And today's message is really about why our focus needs to be on God and why we need to be on alert for idolatry because we worship and serve the God who has made a place for us. A lot of people would probably look at Scripture and say, well, I'm a non-Jewish person. I'm what the Bible would call a Gentile. Where was my place made for me? And a lot of people would just point you to the Gospels, and that, and that is a place. But in Isaiah 56, I hope you can see that there was a place made for you even before that time. God had a place for you, a non-Jew, even before that time. In Isaiah 56, it reads like this, verses 1 through 8. It says, Thus says Yahweh, the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Verse 6, also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his slaves. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and takes hold of my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them glad in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. But the Lord who gathers the banished of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. 
And I thank you for the place you've made for us. I humbly pray that your word be spoken this morning. I pray to just humbly be a vessel. And I am thankful, God, for the provisions you have made for me and for us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What really got me on this, one of the most important things that we need to be in in our daily habit is to be in Scripture somewhere. If you want to focus on the minor prophets, you want to focus on the Old Testament, if you want to focus on the New Testament, you need to be somewhere in Scripture. And I have, I have purposely been in the book of Romans, and I did not tab it like a smart preacher would have done, but in Romans chapter 3, something, it just caught my eye when I heard it. I was listening to it at work. It's in Romans 3, 29, it says, Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. A lot of times in the Old Testament, God is referred to as the God of Israel, and he is the God of Israel, but he is not limited just to that. He is not just the God of a certain kind of people, because that, that, saying that would put him on the pedestal as, okay, Israel has their God, these people have their God, we'll just compare and contrast and we'll make a Venn diagram about whose God is better. And that is not the case. God is the only. Everything else is literally a false God. You have to get to that point. It's not that you're trying to be ugly or mean to people that don't worship God, but you have to have the base understanding that you worship the Most High God. And there is none beside Him. He is in three persons. He's in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But He is the only one. There is no compare and contrast. There is no debate over, well, let's put your God against my God. There is none. There is only one. There is only Yahweh, one of His many names. But what does he say here? The little heading above this piece of scripture in your Bible might say something about save, salvation for the foreigner or salvation for the Gentile. But let's get into it. Isaiah 56 verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, the reminder so much in this prophecy that these are not Isaiah's words, these are God's words. The prophet speaks to the people on God's behalf. This is not Isaiah speaking, this is God speaking through Isaiah. The sailboat does not move on its own. The sailboat needs a sail, and it has the wind to blow it where it's going. Isaiah 56, thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. What does it mean to keep justice? It means the administration of what is just and proper. God is saying, keep justice and do righteousness. What does it mean to do righteousness? Uh, doing righteousness is acting in accord with, with divine law. It is the reminder by God to keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's not a bending of anything. It's just the reminder to keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Keep focused on what I have placed before you to do. For what reason? My salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. This prophecy in Isaiah is around 520 B.C. What is the salvation that was about to come? What is the salvation that was about to come from the Lord? Jesus. This is before the time. Isaiah was prophesying of something to come. My salvation is about to come. Jesus. My righteousness to be revealed. What is God's righteousness? Romans 1, 16 and 17 says... When Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. His righteousness to be revealed is coming. At this point, he's pro Isaiah is prophesying to what is left of the nation of Israel but that righteousness was to come. That salvation was to come. And we are under that righteousness and under that salvation. We have it revealed to us. Verse 2. How blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. What does it mean to be blessed? That word there, how blessed is the man who does this. The Hebrew word there is esher. It means happiness slash blessedness. So it's literally happy is the man who does this. Happy is the woman that does this. Happy is the person that does this. Living within God's divine law is not a system of where 
it, it, it's just... It's just going to be some awful thing, and you're just going to live like a, a, a terrible person. You're just going to sit here and be like, well, i got to make sure I break no rules. No, God's divine law was literally to help the nation of Israel live the best life they could. The law spoke to many things. The law wasn't just the Ten Commandments. The law made provisions for all kinds of things. The law is what told them to stop drinking blood, stop drinking or stop eating uncooked animals. Stop eating these things that can make you sick. That's why you know they don't eat bats and things like that because it's bad stuff, stuff that makes you sick. The law is more than just a bunch of things for people to stick their hand at. It's it's a, a base. It, what it really is is the goodness of God revealed, saying, "I love you and I want what is best for you." There's even a law in Leviticus and it's repeated in Deuteronomy about. You know, back then, using the bathroom, they didn't have running water, and it literally said to go outside the camp, dig a hole, do your business, cover it up in dirt, and get away from it so you wouldn't be around that stuff because it can make you sick. I mean, you know, it makes me laugh a little bit, but, I mean, people didn't know this stuff. It wasn't common sense. God was literally telling his people, this is how you live. This is how I want you to live so that you will prosper, so that you will do good. And not just the man who does it, but and the son of man who takes hold of it. So it's not just the person following it, but the generation behind them to follow it. That's why it's, it's so important for us parents to raise our children up in the knowledge of the Lord and in the faith to pass that faith along. It's not that that faith saves them. They still have to come to Jesus on their own. They're not going to get into heaven just because of our faith, but to raise them up and train them up in that way. Because they're not going to get it anywhere else. And they're not going to, they might get it somewhat through the pastor and somewhat from the youth leader, but I, I have come to know that it is really incumbent upon us parents to have it in the home. we got to have it in the home. I know I've got to do a better job of having it in my home, not just leaving it for Sundays and Wednesday nights at, at small group and Sundays here at, my, at, at, at church. I need to have it more active in my home on a daily basis so that it's not some foreign concept and something we just do two days a week it's every day who keeps from profaning the sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil i'm not talking about when i when it says here who keeps from profaning the sabbath you got to remember something by the time of the new testament where the pharisees and the sadducees were, were running around and just accusing people left and right they had taken the law of the sabbath and they had added so much to it. They had added so much to it. How much did they add to it? They added enough to the Sabbath to the point where even Jesus performing a miracle on the Sabbath offended them. It offended them that Jesus performed a miracle on the Sabbath. That is not what it was intended to be. That's what man had added to it. Man had added to the law, not things that God had given him. They added things that they wanted or their interpretations, rabbinical interpretations, these things they had added to it. Not so much, I think, to keep it holy, but really for more of a place where they could sit there and go, ah, you're a rule breaker. Now nah, you broke the law. You broke a rule. It, it, was a, it was a thing of pride, really. Oh, look, well, we follow the true Sabbath. And it, and it was such a far stretch from what God had given them to be the Sabbath. But what does he mean there? Who keeps from profaning the Sabbath? What was the Sabbath supposed to be? Isaiah 58, 13 and 14 helps make it a little more plain about why God uh, made it such an important deal to have the Sabbath. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own desire on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it by not doing your own ways, by not finding your own desire and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the inheritance of Jacob your father, for the mouth of Yahweh has been spoken. Did God need that seventh day to take a break? Was, was God tired when he created the earth in Genesis? No. God was not tired. God does not tire because God is not human. God is spirit. He didn't need a break. Like you and I, we need a break because we get tired. Parents need a break because we get tired, especially when we got teething children. And I can't wait for the next phase. I think I'm tired now. I'm probably going to be more tired. But God didn't set that, side, that, that day aside because he was tired. He set it aside for a purpose. He recognized and decided that people need a break. 
People need a break. They need a day to set aside things and have a break and to rest. That's why it's the last day of the week. And then Sunday is the first day of the week. And Sabbath is not Sunday, as most of us already know. But it was set there by God for a purpose, to rest. Man took it and added all these things on it. But it was, it was to be a day of rest. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful now I have finally given up on trying to do a lot of things on the Sabbath. I am intentionally almost doing nothing on my Saturday, and it is such a blessing. It is such a blessing to just be like, I don't have to go out to eat. I don't have to make a family plan. I, I hate when we do have to do things on Saturday because I'm just like, man, this, this has got to be my one day of rest. Like, it makes me grumpy, and, you know, I'm bad enough when I'm in a good mood <laughs> when I'm grumpy. But observing the Sabbath is seen here as literally a sign of obedience to God. God set this day aside for you to rest. And you not doing that is a sign of disobedience. It's a sign of saying, well, I know you set aside a day for me to rest, but I got more important things to do. And I'm not hating on you if you go and do things, but I'm saying is God set that side of day for you, that, that, that day aside for you to have rest. And as he puts it here, how blessed is the man who does this, the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath, a symbol of obedience to God. The next part, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. I look at that, and the more I read it over and over again, to me it is winning the battle against the flesh. Keeps his hand from doing any evil is literally winning the battle against the flesh because our flesh wants to sin. Our flesh wants to go and do things that harm us and hurt our testimony and, and just are bad for us. They're sinful. Blessed is the man that keeps his hand from doing any evil from doing something that goes against what God says. No matter what your sin struggle is, we all have something that tears away at us. It can be an addiction. It can be an activity. It could be the way you speak around a certain kind of people. It can be an anger or a frustration that you have. But it is literally your hand doing evil. What God says here is, Blessed is the man who does this and keeps his hand from doing any evil. He is literally going to be happy. You are going to be a happier person not living in sin. You're going to be better off. You're going to be blessed not living in sin. A lot of people will tell you otherwise. be like, I don't know how you're going to get by without, you know, getting drunk on Friday after work. Blessed is the man who keeps his hand from doing evil. These are the words of the Lord. Verse 3. Now we're going to get into the part that applies to you and me. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. To my knowledge, there's nobody in this audience that is a native Israelite. We're, I think we're a completely Gentile congregation, and probably every church you've ever been in is a completely Gentile congregation, because y'all don't wear them little hats. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. What is a foreigner? A foreigner is anyone that is not Israelite. You've got to remember this is Old Covenant. This is under the Old Covenant. What was supposed to happen, as I've read through the Old Testament, what was supposed to happen is the nation of Israel was supposed to follow God and be blessed so much that other nations would look at them and see how blessed they were. They would see the works of the Lord and that they would come to them. They would literally be a nation of priests. That they would come to them and be like, 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 how do I get what you guys have? And that would be their opportunity to lead them to the Lord. Obviously, that is not totally what happened. But it is what was supposed to happen. But what we're talking about foreigners here. you got to remember... In this section of scripture, I talked about it earlier, this was written to Israelites, people, I should just say in general, it's not just Israelites, these were written to people that were returning to the promised land in 520 BC. Israel had been conquered by their enemies because they had disobeyed God, they had been exiled to a couple different places, and it was for a certain period of time. And when that time came up, the people were going to be allowed to come back. So people were coming back to the promised land, but it wasn't just native-born Israelites. There were foreigners among them. There were people that were not native-born Israelites that were, that were coming with them from Babylon and these other places. And there was a great question as to, well, we're all back here now. Who's going to be allowed to worship? 
you got to remember, the temple hasn't been rebuilt yet at this time. The temple is yet to be rebuilt. The wall is yet to be rebuilt. So it's like, well, well who's going to be allowed in? God says it plain and clear. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the foreigner say. Don't let the non-Israelites say, well, God's going to sift me out of his people. You know, you ever seen a sift where people are, they got a whole bunch of sand, they put it on this thing, they shake it, and they're hoping to find some gold or something precious in it. He's saying, let not the foreigner say, who has joined himself to the Lord, say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Don't let him say that. Don't let the foreigner think that he's going to be separated, the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord. Don't let him say that. Nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Anybody know what a eunuch is? A eunuch is a man that was castrated or unable to reproduce. In Matthew 19 Jesus lays it out pretty plainly that there are three kinds of eunuchs. There are some that were born that way. They were, they were born unable to reproduce. There were some that were made that way. Someone would make a man a eunuch if they were in charge of a, of a harem of women. A lot of times it was like a royal harem of women that these kings would have. And they needed a man kind of to, to like be their security, to watch over them. Well, how are you going to keep that man from you know, going about uh, business of the flesh, make him a eunuch. I don't need to go in the anatomy of it, but make him a eunuch so he won't, you know, so he won't go and do those things. Imagine the eunuch that they probably had over all Solomon's wives and concubines. He probably needed more than one. And there are some eunuchs, Jesus said in Matthew 19, that chose to be that way. Now you're sitting there thinking like, why in God's name would you do that? I mean, that's just painful. Like, Ouch. Like, that's horrible. But some people would, for the sake of servitude, they would do that out of servitude to say, you know what, I don't want to, you know, sully myself with, 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 with pursuits of the flesh and things like that, so I'm going to handle business myself and make myself where I'm not even going to be tempted in any way. Unfortunately, in this day and age, through the movement that's afoot now, you got a lot of children that are being made eunuchs. There's that poor kid, the, the, the kid on TLC, Jazz Jennings, that through the terrible, sinful view and ideas of his parents was literally made a eunuch by his parents because his parents had this idea that, yeah, he can be whatever he wants to be. That's not a girl. I mean, that's not a man. That's not a boy. That's a girl. And they literally chemically and through surgery have made this person a eunuch and no matter how many surgeries and how much medicine they pump into him they, they can't make him a girl but they, they're doing everything they can now he is chemically a eunuch he cannot reproduce and a lot of these people are falling for this and going for this and they, they see it as some sort of great extension of liberty like oh I have the freedom to do this what they've literally done is they've literally cut off the opportunity for these people to, to reproduce and to bear fruit. They've removed it from them. In the, it wasn't too long ago in Europe, the greatest form of entertainment was the opera, was, was singing. And what happens with males? Once males get into puberty... Their voice begins to drop and, they, and they, they go through puberty and all the changes that goes with it. So what would they do? They would take these boys that they wanted to be like the opera superstars and they would make them a eunuch. They called them the castrati. And the castrati is it, so different because they still had that kind of higher pitched voice like a boy would have. But they had the added inflection of, you know, a man's got a little stronger diaphragm and stuff so they could belt in a louder tone than say like a woman could and they were the superstars of the opera and they could kind of do whatever they wanted sexually because they they well, there were no consequences they were castrati they were made eunuchs for some reason and when when push came to shove and they got to the end of their life they had no fruit to bear because they were literally made a eunuch in israel Eunuchs were severely looked down upon. The law mentions eunuchs. The reason the law mentions eunuchs and not to allow them in the assembly in Deuteronomy was because the Lord 
through the law says he did not want the Israelites going and doing this stuff because the pagans were doing this stuff. The Romans, these other uh, societies, they were doing this stuff. It was perfectly normal back then to see a bunch of eunuchs walking around. God did not want Israel following suit of that. That's why he put in the law to not have the eunuchs joining in the assembly. He didn't want them practicing this thing because, I mean, it's a terrible practice. It's one thing if you're born that way. It's another thing when you're made that way. You can't bear no fruit. You cannot bear no fruit. It is a terrible regret. It is a terrible regret. A lot of times it's not an instant regret, but it is a regret down the road. It's a terrible regret. But God makes a provision here. He says, nor let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. A dry tree is a, a tree that bears no fruit. It's a dry tree. He said, don't let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, verse 4, to the eunuchs, he's going to address the eunuchs first, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. He says, if a eunuch that is keeping God's Sabbath is choosing what pleases God and holds fast to God's covenant. This is someone who is not welcome in the nation of Israel. This is someone who is not welcome. This is someone who is seen as weird. This is someone who is seen as a lawbreaker. This is someone who is on the outside, not welcomed by these people. To the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who chooses what pleases me and holds fast my covenant, Verse 5, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial. And a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. So to this group of people that are seen as they'll never be able to be redeemed. They are not worthy. God makes a provision for him and says, if a eunuch keeps my Sabbath, being obedient to me, choose what pleases me, going against what their fleshly desire is or what they think is right, choosing what pleases God, setting aside their own will, choosing what pleases God, and hold fast to my covenant, the covenant of the God of Israel, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. It is an incredible blessing to be a child of God. And and you got to remember, we are not born children of God. We are creations of God. We are given the right to become children of God upon upon salvation, upon repentance of sin and salvation. Asking Jesus to be in our heart and that moment of salvation. That's when you become a child of God. But he says here to these eunuchs, I will give them uh, in my house, within my walls, memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. Someone who is outside the camp that still wants to be a part, that is still willing to lay down their will and lay down all the things that they worship and worship the God of Israel. He'll give them a name better than that of sons and daughters. What a provision made by God to someone that we would probably look at as a weirdo. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. I talk about that Jazz Jennings guy. If Jazz Jennings walked into a church and genuinely repented and genuinely joined himself to the Lord, confessed the sins of himself and turned turned back and said, you know what, Lord? I I confess my sin before you. I confess the idolatry that I fell into. I give myself over to you, Lord. I plead for your forgiveness. I ask your son to come into my heart and be my savior. I genuinely believe that person would be forgiven. He can't take back the things that have been done to him or that he did. That damage is done permanent. You don't get that back unless unless God sees so. But that person, I humbly believe, would be forgiven and would become a child of God. Just because things were done of the past, we all come forward and we all have sin to confess. And no one of our sins is worse than the other. If you break, James says you break one law, you're guilty of breaking all the law. Your shoplifting charge right next to someone who has a murder charge. Now we might look at that person with a murder charge a little funny and be like, eh, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I want to trust them too much. What does God say? Come before me and kneel in repentance, confession of sin, and welcoming of Jesus into their heart. 
He makes a place for the person that we would probably reject because they look different, they smell different, they act different, they talk different. He makes that provision. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Verse 6. I don't think any of us are eunuchs, but we are all foreigners. Verse 6 is going to address us. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his slaves, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and takes hold of my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them glad in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Not some of the peoples, all the peoples. This is addressed to us. We are foreigners. None of us are born of the nation of Israel. None of us, as far as I know, are native-born Israel. We are the wild, the, the, the wild olive branch that is sown in upon confession of sin, repentance, and salvation. We are the wild olive branch that gets sown in. And also through Scripture it says, we are not to look down upon the branch that is below us. We get sown in. It is not for us to look down upon the root that we are sown into. We're just glad to be a part of it. We're glad that salvation has come to us. To the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord. It's just like he said with the eunuch. Foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord. To be his servant or his slave. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath. Again, profaning the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath holy is a symbol of obedience. And takes hold of my covenant. It's not just a thing where you, you're getting it for free. There are things you have to do. There are, you have to repent. You have to turn. You have to say, I'm going to quit worshiping these things and I'm going to worship the Lord. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain. What does God mean by his holy mountain? Isaiah 2 says it like this. Now it will be that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the head of the mountains and will be lifted up above the hills and all the nations will stream to it and many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us from his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion, the law will go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears from pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. God makes a provision for the foreigner, the person who is an outsider looking in. He says, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them glad in my house of prayer. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Do you think God takes seriously that his house is to be a house of prayer for all peoples? Do you need evidence of how serious God takes this? What did Jesus do in Matthew 21? Why was Jesus so mad in Matthew 21 when he got the bullwhip out and turned tables over? Because he said, you have taken my house that was a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. You have made it a place that takes advantage of people financially, that takes advantage of these people coming in from the outside. And you have taken my house that was to be a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. The most angry and upset Jesus got was that people that went against what his house was supposed to be. His house was not to be a place for sifting and sorting. His house was to be a house of prayer for all peoples. Where the foreigner and the eunuch could come in and worship God and learn about God and hear the scripture and, and be in concert with people that would be willing to teach and to share in the knowledge of the Lord. It was not to be a place where we just sit here and we, we cross something off our checklist and we feel better about ourselves for coming here and well I'm doing better than such and such because at least I made it to church. No. Best example I've, give, I've, I've heard of this was uh, Brian Bigger's Lamb's Chapel. He said... And I've heard other guys say this too. It's not just him. <clears throat> the church is not supposed to be some 
like car dealership where you got all the nice fancy cars within glass and it's like, oh, look at this, oh, look at this. It is supposed to be more like a hospital where the sick come looking for the Savior. That's what it's supposed to be. Not coming here to brag about who we are, but coming here to draw the strength that we need from the Scripture, from the fellowship, from the singing, and to take it back out in the other six days that we're out in the world to go out and share the Gospel and share the Word and not just share it with the world, but to implement it into our own life and to take it into our homes. Take it with our kids if they're going to public school or when they're interacting with other people. Take it with you when you interact with your neighbor or your mailman or the UPS man, the Amazon man, the FedEx man, the DHL man, whoever delivers packages to your house, and to take it forth and share it. It's not just a place to sit and get fat and be happy. It's not what it was supposed to be. God makes a provision for foreigners like you and me. There are no foreigners in the faith. In Galatians chapter 2, or excuse me, rather, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, it says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to to the promise. God is no respecter of persons. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 puts it this way. For also by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Romans three twenty two says it this way. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction There is no distinction. That's why I'm a firm believer, and it's unfortunate that it happened this way, but it's just church history, and it's just where we come from. It's where I think the the downside of all these different denominations is. I look at it now, and I'm like, man, we we got 10 bajillion different denominations, and I'm just like, how much did we, through human history, divide up God's house? Based on what? Based on personal preferences? Based on, well, I'd rather see things done this way. And it's, it's like nothing that's based in Scripture. It's just personal preference. It's just personal opinion that separates us. When I go through and look through different denominations, what usually separates them is, well, this is how this denomination does business. They're elder-led. This is how this denomination does it. They're, they're preacher-led. This is how these people vote. This is how they people vote. This is how they come to a decision. Here's how they come to a decision. And, 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 and I get personal preferences, but I think above personal preference is we were supposed to be one body, but we split each other up over silly things. There's an example, I think it's in West Virginia. There's two churches on the same street. One is called Right Foot Baptist Church. Another one on that same road is called Left Foot Baptist Church. Well, what, what in God's name is the difference? What is the difference is these churches had as part of their ordination, you know, our, our ordinations of the church are baptism and uh, observing communion, the Lord's Supper. Well, they added to that and said that, that foot washing was one of the ordinances, and they did it every week. I think Primitive Baptists do this sometimes. So they added that into it. Okay, you know, foot washing. You know, not my idea of a fun time, but, you know, if, if, if you're doing it with a servant's heart, God bless you. They couldn't decide on, well, which foot should you wash first? Well, we believe the right foot. Well, we believe the left foot. And they split a church over that silly little personal preference of what foot do you grab first? I'm going to tell you, it don't matter which of my feet you grab first. I'm going to pray for you immediately because it's going to stink. I'm I'm a terrible foot sweater. My feet smell horrible. I'll pray for you for that. But just that little personal preference, and they split a church, and they put it in the name. And I sit there sometimes, I don't know if y'all do this, I get in that habit when we're driving down back country road and you see a church and we try to guess the denomination. I mean, that's pretty high steeple. I bet that's Nazarene or I bet that's a Methodist or, or you see something else. You ever seen that church that's got like eight different things in front of it? It's got like, like kind of like John Boy and Billy used to say, the short of Joshua, fully gospel, Pentecostal assembly. 
And I'm just like, man, the more words you need to describe, the more adjectives you need. It's kind of like your order at Starbucks. The more adjectives you need to describe your order, the more I just, I, the less I trust you. Like, why can't you just drink your coffee black like the rest of us Christians? Why you got to add 10 billion things to it? And that's a silly example. But I, just, I look at that and I'm just like, man, why did we, we divided the house of God up so much based on personal preference. That's why I'm glad we just have a nice simple name, River Church. Come on into the River Church. Are you Baptist? Are you Presbyterian? Are you focused on God? Focused on God's word. Well, what's your statement on this? What does the Bible say? It's not based on some you know, personal preference, no crazy thing, just based on what God's word said. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He welcomes in the foreigner. He welcomes in the eunuch who otherwise is on the outside looking in. But these people that are seen as outsiders by Israel, they join themselves to the Lord. They observe his covenant. They hold fast to what pleases him. They are willing to be servants of his even though other people would look at them and go, nah, you're not welcome. It's what got us in a lot of trouble through the civil rights era. How many people did we not allow in churches because they had a little more melanin in their skin than others? How many ministers stood in pulpits and actively preached against people having the same freedoms we had by twisting scripture into saying something that it doesn't? How much damage did we do? How much wrath did we inflict upon ourselves by sitting there and doing that and looking at people as we look at them on the outside when we know Scripture tells us that God looks on the inside? God does not look on the outer appearance of man like we do. God looks on the inside. He looks at their heart. And it's, I know it's hard for us to do. It's hard for us to, to get out of that. But that's part of the process of sanctification. It's a daily work. It's a daily process. We're becoming more like God. To not judge somebody that comes in here you know, we pick on tattoos a lot because a lot of people judge off of tattoos, and I think, we've, I think we're, we're pretty well past that, and we don't judge people by that. What if you saw someone come in here? I seen somebody one time. It was like a gauge thing, but it was like right there in their lip, and you could like see straight through their gums. And I look at that, and I'm like, man, that, that looks painful. That looks ouch. But you know what? If someone came in here with that, 20 earrings in each ear, and a limp, and smelled funny, I would hope and pray, and I know this church, we would welcome them in and say, come on in. we got a seat for you. Come on in here and, and, and be with us in fellowship and let us tell you about Jesus. Let us tell you about what the Scriptures say. Let us tell you about salvation. That would be my plea from this piece of Scripture today, that we would be not so focused on the outside, but welcome in the foreigner. Welcome in the eunuch. Welcome in the person that has, has made the mistakes of doing these things to themselves or their parents have made the choice to do these things to them. And something, it finally, the Holy Spirit, finally something clicks in them that I'm not happy. Something's missing. I feel terrible and sorry for these people. But they need the, they need the gospel preached to them. I got people in my life, I don't know if I messaged the preacher text about it or what. I think I did. I got people in my life that I'd, I'd gotten tired of praying for them. I really had. I got tired of praying for them. I was just like, and I found a verse to back it up too. I went to Romans, and I, in Romans chapter 1, and I said, God, they're just giving over to a debased mind. I'm going to quit praying for them. They're clearly not interested. I just, I got tired. I didn't, I didn't take it as some prideful thing. I, I was really sad about it, but I was just like, this, this is just what it is. They're just giving over. And I don't know who said it. But it was just a reminder that it's not for me to decide when it's time to stop praying for him. The light can come back on. I listened to this podcast of this, it was a story of this woman who had, uh, she had gone through the whole LGBTQIA plus minus sign, division sign, whatever, had gone through that whole life, had gotten married to another woman, had, had, had gone into this lifestyle, changed her name to a man's name, had, had done all these things had been down that path for 10 years. And the Holy Spirit spoke to her. And it took a while, but she couldn't take back the things that she had done. But she got divorced from 
the person that she was legally married to, she got back into church and it was brought to her attention that there was someone in that church that had never stopped praying for her. Even when she was so far gone, you'd have thought anybody else would have looked at her and said, waste of a prayer. Someone kept praying. And I got, I got some in my life that I got re-energized by Scripture and I was just like, you know what? I don't need to stop praying until I can't pray anymore for them. No matter how far gone I think they are, they can still come. Just as I am. Verse 8 wraps it up. The Lord who gathers the banished of Israel declares, Yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. Not just Israelites, but gathering in that wild olive branch that we are. Yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. John chapter 10, verses 14 and 16. You probably know this scripture pretty well. You might have forgot this last part though. Part of the I am the good shepherd. Jesus says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16, and I have other sheep which are not from this fold. I must bring them in also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. I have other sheep who are not from this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. God makes a place for us. He has made a place for us. Over and over, Scripture tells us, God has made a place for us. In teaching against idolatry, are we making a place for Him in us? Are we being welcoming? Are we being like the foreigner and the eunuch listed in Isaiah 56? Even though we're on the, we should be on the outside looking in, are we joined together with God in His covenant? Are we doing the things that He has told us to do? Are we following when Jesus was asked about the law? And He sums it up in two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can wrap up the Ten Commandments just in those two verses. Are you actually making the place? Because clearly through Scripture, God has made the place for us. But have we made the place for Him? Have we allowed ourselves to be a servant of the Lord? Have we, to be someone's servant, to be the Lord's servant, requires us to lay down the things that we were doing. To lay aside the things that we were doing that were not glorifying God. I'll tell you all this story as I wrap up. There was a time... 2018, it was, finally, it was finally hitting me hard. I was no longer having fun traveling and announcing races. Something just wasn't there. The joy was being taken away from me. And I'm hard-headed. It took me years to, to finally answer the call. And I remember one time, I said, well, you know what might quench the thirst? You know what might, might uh, cross it off the checklist? Is, is well, what if I start offering like a chapel service? At the, at, the, at, the, at the races before the races start. That, that'll be good enough. That'll be good enough. And I never had more than three people. I did it for a couple years. I never had more than three or four people. And I was just like, well, well why ain't this working? This, this chapel service, I'm speaking about God. And it got reminded of me by the Holy Spirit. They're not there for that. They're distracted. They're not there to hear you. They're there to, to do something else. You're just a little five-minute distraction for them. Is doing that little five minutes enough? I'm talking about myself. Is, is doing that little five minutes enough to do what I'm supposed to be doing? And it was revealed to me, no, it's not. There's more you need to do. It's worthy of more than just five minutes. I've given up the ability to make a lot more money than I am now turning down those gigs because now they can't find nobody else to do them. Nobody wants to do that work anymore. It's kind of like preaching. <laughs> I go to these places. I, I, I hate to leave you guys when I, when I go preach to these other places, but I, I'm tugged at my heartstrings because they don't have people to preach to them. And in one place, they're just like they're so receptive to it and they're just like, man, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Can you come next week? And I have to 
you know, I got to slow down on it because when, when I'm not here, I'm, I'm giving out. When I'm here, I get, I get filled up. My tank gets filled up. It ain't no high charge like it is at the gas station. I get filled up spiritually by the singing and by the fellowship and by the people that we have here. It, it, it fills my tank up. And when I go out in these other places, I'm, I'm, I'm giving all I got. Because a lot of them I'm going into and they are just dark and they are cloudy and there is no Holy Spirit in there and they have quenched it through religion and through these other things. And I just, I feel sorry for them. It, it breaks my heart because I, I feel like most of them would, would, are, would be receptive. But they don't have it. It's like, you get in touch with the Holy Spirit enough, you will recognize it real quick when you walk into a dead church. You will walk into some place where Scripture is not being taught, religion is being taught. Where the songs that are being sung are not sung to glorify God, they are being sung to cross something off the list. Well, thank God we stayed in the red book and we stayed in the hymnals. Make sure we did that right. And there's no glorifying of God. You see no response. You feel nothing because you're just, you're just in a dead church. It's the whole reason this place was started back in 2016. A bunch of people that were like, I'm tired of just doing religion and doing church for the sake of doing it. I want more out of it. I want the Holy Spirit. I want Jesus. I want teachings that I can apply. And I want things that are based on Scripture, not based on opinions. That's why I want to continue to be here. That's why I want to stay here. I don't feel the tug yet to go somewhere else. And I don't want to go somewhere else. When I go to these other places, I, I give everything I have. But I want to come back here and get filled back up. Because you'll realize that when you, if you go somewhere else to visit, you'll realize real quick, you walk into a lot of dead places. And it's, it's hard to be the person that stands up at the front and is trying to you know, throw flames at a bunch of ice cubes that are sitting there frozen. We come here, man, and I am just filled up. I am just filled up and fully satisfied. And I hope that you, through the Scripture that our pastors bring and through the songs that we sing, I hope that you are filled with the Holy Spirit where you will go back and look at the Scripture that is taught. I will, I will give you my notes. I know Jesse will give you his notes. Michael will give you his notes. The lyrics of the songs, you take a picture of them on your phone, you copy and paste them, whatever it is, we will give it to you. There's no great secret here. All we want to do is present the Scripture and present God and be welcoming to the Holy Spirit. That's what we seek to do. And I hope that you will go forward and make a house for the Lord. Make a place for the Lord like He has made a place for you through Isaiah 56. He doesn't just make a place for the people that you think and that we think are the elect and Christians. He looks at it differently. He makes a place for the eunuch. He makes a place for the foreigner. He makes a place. Will we make a place for him? Let's pray. Father God, I am thankful to just be a servant. I am thankful, Lord, to just have the opportunity. I'm thankful, Lord, for these that are here, that are around me, Lord, that I know are willing to serve, that give up their time and give up their effort they give up things, Lord, to be here worshiping You, praising Your name through song, through Scripture, through prayer. I pray, Lord, we would never tire of this work. Even when everything around us, the culture, school, society, media, all these things come against what Your Word says. And they come against what delights you i pray lord that we would hold firm and hold firm in the promise that god you have made a place for us you have made the provision for us we did not earn it and we do not deserve it it is purely of grace not of works lest any man should boast it is pure we are living in your grace we are living in your grace and i know we humbly seek for others to know Your grace. 
We're the beggar that has found some food that isn't just going and burying it and hiding it, but we're trying to go tell other beggars, this is where the food is, guys. This is where the nourishment is. That's what we seek to be. I pray, God, You keep us on task. I pray You keep us on mission. And I pray, God, this church, no matter how big or how small it ever gets, would continue to stay focused on what is most important. Welcoming Your Holy Spirit. Preaching Your Word. Teaching Jesus. And being a place where the foreigner and the eunuch that wants to fasten themselves to You, God, would be welcome. Because we have been welcomed. We don't want to hold You like some secret. We want to shout You from the mountaintops for as long and as loud as we can. And I pray we would continue to do that. We've been doing that, God. I pray we would continue to do that. That we would not be satisfied by anything other than going out and preaching Your Word. Sharing Your Word. Showing the fruits of being faithful to you, God. I pray all this in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, that we would not tire, we would continue to work. In Christ's name, amen.